Hello, I'm Joe Chamberlain, uh, Executive Director of the Coastside Land Trust here in Half Moon Bay, California. We're delighted to have with us again this Saturday, Alvaro Jara Mio. This time, we're treated to Birds of the Harbor, specifically the harbor here in Half Moon Bay. But these, I believe, and Alvaro, you can help with this, are birds you could see at other harbors along the coast. Is that correct, Alvaro? Yeah, yeah, sure, exactly. Um, well, Joe, thank you. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, a, a, this is going to be um, specific to Pillar Point Harbor, which is the harbor right by Half Moon Bay. And then it applies to a lot of different coastal sites and um, harbors in, in what I'd call the cold water region of, of the West Coast. So once you get to su Southern California, it changes a little bit. Um, um, just uh, it was funny. I was when I was doing this talk, and I, I put in the title "Birding the Harbor." Um, I, re I I just got this flashback, you know, of having come here to Half Moon Bay from Canada, and how long it took me to write "harbor" without a "u." So I still look at this word "harbor" without a "u," and I think it's wrong and misspelled. But uh, so some things, you know, you you just never get used to, uh, you know, as opposed to how you grew up with. Um, things like spelling and so forth. But I grew up with different birds too. So that was one of the exciting things about actually um, moving out here and seeing some completely different birds. And um, there was a question last time. So this has got nothing to do with the harbor about nemesis birds, things that I've looked for or, or you know, um, I just have failed at finding or they, they just sort of cause some kind of, you know, feelings of being irked that I haven't found these things or seen these things. Now, I think I mentioned one of them in the past. It's, this is a California scrub jay, the, the guy in blue here, blue and white. And I, it's one of the most common birds in all of California. And I've never seen one in my backyard. It's been a long time, over 10 years in the same backyard. I've never seen one here. And uh, they're nearby, they just, um, they just need very specific types of habitats with, you know, larger trees and sort of the Alsace-Lorraine area doesn't have big tall trees and we don't have chaparral. We actually are, are kind of exposed to the, to the environment here. And it, it's sort of interesting that something so common that we think of as really common does still have specific needs. Every bird, every bit of, every plant, every animal has a specific needs and they can be broad but sometimes if you don't have that one thing that they need they will not be there so i think it's kind of a it's a nemesis because i haven't seen it here but it also taught me a lot about scrub jays the other thing see, see this kind of chicken like bird here on the right side this is one of the hardest species to see in all of the American continent. This is a bird from the far south, from Patagonia, and it's called uh, Fuijin snipe. We have snipe in, in North America, Wilson snipe, but this is a big, huge kiwi-like snipe that is super, super hard to find. It's one of the few birds that, I mean, I could say maybe fewer than a hundred birders have seen this species, but it's out there. And I, I have always wanted to see it. I've never been able to see it. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm considered sort of a person who really knows about this region of the world in Chile. And I dream of seeing this, and it's not much of a bird, but I think one day I'll be able to see that. So it's not quite a nemesis, it's just like a dream. So there you go, nemesis and dream birds. And we're in birding the harbor, and this is going to be, um, it's going to include gulls, terns, some ducks, some shorebirds, cormorants, pelicans. So. If you start kind of putting all these harbor birds together as a group, they, they're really diverse. But one of the things that's interesting about them and maybe very good if you're beginning at, at birds is that they're big. A lot of them are just big birds, easier to see than going to the woods when we were, you know, talking about going up to Burley Murray or Quarry Park and then looking for warblers. Those are harder to see. They're up in the trees and you have to sort of, you know, maybe you hear them and then you have to really kind of be adept at your binocular use to try to, to try to see them. Some of these harbor birds are right out in the open and they're big. So, so that makes things easier for, especially for the, the beginner. We, um, 
we have a really special harbor. Uh, we have um, the uh, what I would call a quirky harbor. We, you know, it's not all fancy for the tourist, or you know, it's not. It's not. It's a real harbor, and real harbor things happen here. People actually go fishing. Um, people live in the harbor. We have kind of derelict boats that you know hang in there in the harbor, and all sorts of things going on. It's almost like a like um, um, a little mini world, our harbor. And also, I would argue that our harbor is is also, you know, sort of the, the heart of the coast side, Half Moon Bay. If we did not have the harbor, it would be a completely different place. It would lose a lot of its uh, just difference to a lot, to sm a small town on the coast. Um, we have this, you know, harbor where people do have, you know, do commercial fishing and we do, you know, sports fishing, um, as well as, you know, we have fun in the harbor and, you know, if you, in the Christmas uh, period when, when the boats all get lit up, that's just, just a lot of fun. And um, I, I would, uh, you know, if, if you've come in and, and, you know, haven't been living here for a long time where you come to visit, I think you, you know that the harbor is special and also, you know, any element of, the, when, when, when we talk about fish and the problems with fish, it really is sort of a, 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 you know, a point that you want to understand that the, you know, the, the survival of these harbors is really tenuous and it depends on the environment, economics, and actually people making deci decisions on where they're going to buy their fish. And uh, I would suggest if you can, if you live here, support your harbor and buy local fish. Um, one of the things that I find um, really interesting, and it, this happens all over North America, all over the US, um, and people go to coastal sites and they go to eat fish at restaurants and so forth. We know very little about the fish and where it comes from and what it is and whether it's from there or not. You know, so this, this tuna, this albacore here on this side, with a very long fin, that albacore is a tuna that's a small size tuna with really, really long fins. Um, they, they show up here when there's warm water and where that warm water comes closer to shore when it's you know within 30 40 miles of here you can go out albacore fishing but um most years there's no albacore these these are you know warm water fish and we never have the truly warm warm water fish so mahi mahi if you if you know that you know so what they know as dorado in other places we don't have that fish so if you if you're eating a mahi mahi sandwich in you know in much of California or further north it's not from anywhere around here it's from somewhere else and that you know sometimes they'll people will say oh it's it's local fish and it, it's not um, so it's we we need to sort of get a little bit better at understanding what is local fish and what isn't and one of the things that you can do is actually go buy fish from the docks uh, from the harbor and or Dungeness crabs salmon rockfish sand dabs whatever is, is out there um, at that time, um, black cod's actually super, super good fish. They call it sable fish too. And you can also check um, what fish is the right one to eat or not. There are a couple of resources. One of them is called, I think it's called Ocean Watch, is it? Um, from um, Monterey Bay um, Aquarium. I might've gotten the name wrong, but you can download that and start learning a bit more about what fish is healthy to be eating in terms of the environment and what is your local fish and try to buy local fish if you can and support your local harbors and local fishing communities. So here's um, Pillar Point Harbor from above. Google map, if you, you know, sort of were to, th you know, the golf ball, the, the Air Force base is sort of over here on the left side. The main part of the harbor with the boat slips and so forth is in here and it's like protected by these, these rock jetties. This outer jetty here that it has no connection, that's a really good one for breeding birds because, you know, nothing can kind of get on there other than uh, it's something that can swim or fly. So that's a very important breeding site for some of our birds. We have the pier down the middle here where you park. And if you go over towards the south, there's the boat launch. The boat launch is a great place to go see sh roosting shorebirds and gulls on the base of this other jetty over here. Um, and then if you go further over towards the airport, you get to the point, there's a creek mouth here. This is San Vicente Creek. That's a really great place to, to go see birds that are bathing in freshwater, especially in winter. You'll have gulls and ducks and, and 
geese and so forth that, that come in here to bathe in that fresh water because there's actually fresh water coming in from that creek. Um, I've even seen steelhead trout coming in there in the winter, which is, which is really cool. And then as you go further out towards Mavericks, and Mavericks is sort of the wave that's out over outside of the uh, um, Air Force, the, the golf ball, you get to this area that uh, the, the road goes around the salt marsh, which is a, a unique environment I'll talk to you about. And then you can go out to the base of this other jetty where there's a lot of great shorebirds that you can see and even the outside here where you can look at cormorants and other birds. So there's all sorts of different spots that you can visit um, and at the harbor and each one sort of offers a different different type of um, uh, environment. Uh, when you're going around the road that goes around the salt marsh, there's there are willow thickets all in here that you don't have access to. You can just sort of see them from um, from the road, but uh, those are great spots. And then you can also go up top of the bluffs, and that's a, a super spot for birds of the chaparral and so forth. Um, so I'll be talking to you about all of these things and um, get at sort of some of the most common things you first see when you get to the harbor. And one of them is this bird called Brewer's Blackbird, which I showed you on the very first talk. And I showed you this shiny, shiny, shiny bird with a yellow eye. That was the male. And this is the female. Females much more brownish with a dark eye. And um, sometimes they'll have a little iridescence on the, on the back and on the wings if you look at them very carefully. But they're really, really a nice looking, very well-shaped bird. I, I, I like to think of them, you know, the, the red-winged blackbirds or the cowbirds have these bills that are either too long or too thick. You know, they look kind of out of place. Um, while, and, well, you know, the cowbirds have really short legs, so they look kind of stumpy, but Brewer's Blackbird is this really great shaped bird. And I, I always tell people that, that are starting, especially, or even expert birders that have ignored shape in their birds, that it's really, really key. Once you know the shape of something, you don't need to see the color sometimes to identify these birds. It's just like knowing the shape of a breed of dog. You don't need to know if it's a dark one or a golden or this or that. You just know the shape of that dog and you go, oh, I know it's a Labrador. Um, so it's, it's kind of the same thing if you, if you concentrate on shape. Um, when, one of the stars of the show out there is the brown pelican. And um, the brown pelican is a specific population that that lives here in California and Baja called the California brown pelican. Now it's 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 a brown pelican. It's not a different species from the one you see in Florida, but it's a different population with some slight differences in color. And um, one of the things is if you see this flying bird, you see that red at the base of the, the pouch? Only the California brown pelicans ever get red and that's right at the breeding start of the breeding season they'll get super red in there and for us it's winter when we'll see the the red and when when they're non-breeding these pelicans have yellow heads and a white neck and the adults have a grayish body all the belly is all grayish it's sort of so they don't have white on the belly and then this one here on the right is starting to get dark on the neck when they're in full breeding plumage they get a, a whole dark brownish, blackish brown sort of back of the neck and they get a little bit more of a crest so they, they become fancier for a little bit and um, again these are these are adult adult pelicans we're talking about here and then when you go to you, know, you see a big mass of pelicans then you'll see that these winter adults with the white heads you see how they have the gray body almost silvery and they look almost hairy because some of the feathers have a white stripe down the middle of each feather. And then you have these other brownish ones that have white bellies. The brown ones with white bellies are young birds. They also have a, a brown head, but over the years they become more and more adult-like. They'll start getting speckles of dark on the belly and they'll start getting more grayish rather than brownish above. But amazingly enough, it can take a pelican five, at least five years to mature to adult plumage. And when you see, like right now, if you go to the harbor right now and you see some of these uh, young brown pelicans, where, especially if you look at the wing, every little feather just looks crisp and clean and every feather looks about the same tone. They don't look patchy or messy. They just look really crisp. Those are birds that hatch this year. So they don't breed around here. The pelicans breed in Southern California and Baja 
they come up here after breeding. And this year, there are a lot of these real nice crisp looking ones, which we call juveniles. Those are the first kind of uh, plumage that a bird, a bird gets. So we know they had a really good breeding season. So that's good. Uh, when there's a good breeding season, it means um, there's, um, there's been a lot of food in the environment. Um, one thing uh, about pelicans, if you go look for them right now, and you really sort of stare intently at all the pelicans, look at their legs. Some of them have these colored bands with numbers on them. And the numbers are big enough that you can read them. If you're close enough with binoculars or a telescope or even taking a picture and then blowing it up, you can read these bands. If you see them, the color of the band tells you something. The blue are birds that were rehabbed by um, International Bird Rescue in the North Bay. What rehab birds are birds that were injured or caught in, in you know, fishing line or perhaps you know, had other issues of some kind, somebody found them and they, they were taken into re the rehab center and then they're, they're brought back to health. You put a band on them and the idea is that by seeing how many of these individuals are seen again, they get a sense for what types of injuries actually birds can bounce back from and also you know they get a better idea of, of what worked and what you know what might have not worked in terms of their rehabbing so it's very important to get that information back to them if they have a white band means it was an organ a rehab bird green uh, were birds that were in an oil spill and had to be cleaned from an oil spill in 2015 and red birds like this one here on the right red banded birds uh, were banded in mexico so you can you can actually uh, find out a lot about them, and you can send these these you know um, numbers into the. You could actually contact birdrescue.org, and they have a way to you know on their website um, sort of tell you how to um, get this information back to them, and eventually to the central storehouse, which is called the Bird Banding Lab, which is uh, in Washington. So watch for these things, and um, yeah, we can learn a lot by, by reading these bands. One of the few species where the where reading bands is actually kind of easy to do, and we have so many pelicans, we can have you know, over a thousand pelicans at any one time this time of year in, in the harbor, so keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> cormorants, so cormorants are related to pelicans. They don't have the big pouch, but they actually have a little pouch in there that you can sometimes see, and in some species that pouch can be colorful. We, um, cormorants are, are generally black, dark, and then they differ a bit on shape and the structures and colors around the face. The name comes from sort of old French, kind of the seagoing French, um, maybe a, a mix of Latin and French. It's a very old name, which means sea crow. So these are the old sea crows. Um, because they're black and they're in the ocean. So crows are black and these are ocean versions of the crow. Um, but they're not related to crows. It's just the color that people were, were, were looking at and to give them these names. And we have double crested cormorant here, Brant's cormorant and pelagic cormorant. Um, double crested is this one with all of this orange around the face. So if you see orange on the face and orange on the base of the beak and that, that pouch, you know it's a double crested. They also can sometimes look really scaly on the back. They're not as dark black as the other two in good light. And this scaliness is just, it's what it is, is each feather has a darker edge to it. So it outlines each feather in a way that, you know, almost looks like a, like a painting. Um, you can, this is the kind of thing I always tell people, you can look at a lot of things in nature in different ways. You can either say, oh, look at that ugly old black bird over there, the cormorant, or you can look at it in detail and say, wow, that's like a really beautiful pattern on that cormorant. It all depends on how you see it and sometimes what you see it with. This is why having binoculars can be really good. Uh, if, you're, if you're just starting out and you don't know if you're gonna invest in binoculars, you can see things closer and see details that might not be obvious um, when you're just watching them with your eyes. Um, <clears throat> and um, let's see, is the cormorants there? Can you see them? Somebody told me I'm not, they're not seeing the cormorant slide. Um, if not, let's see. Um, that's that's interesting. The pelicans. Let's see if that works. Seeing the cormorant slide there. Um, let me know if you're seeing the cormorant slide. Um, 
Okay, now it's being seen fine. So now you can make sense of what I just said about the this double crested cormorant with this good looking back coloration. And then these other two species, brands, have this buffy. At the buffy is kind of this pale brown color uh, at the base of the beak, and they're very dark. And then the pelagic down here is really skinny necked. It's got this little skinny bill, little tiny head, a real skinny neck, almost like snake like neck. And that's how you ident identify it most easily. It doesn't have any of that buffy. And up close with, um, <clears throat> And see, here's the, uh, the oh, here's another picture of cormorants. Uh, it's kind of moving around by itself here for a second, not sure what's happening. Um, and you see two different, different com cormorant heads here. The one on the left being a double crested with that orange around the, um, the bill. And then a really close up view of a branch where you can see in the breeding season that they, um, they have this beautiful blue color um, on the on the pouch. Like it's not the pelican pouch, it's similar, it's much smaller. But there you go, branch cormorants. And when you get up close to cormorants, their eye colors are really, really awesome. They can either have bright emerald green eyes or blue eyes like this, this branch cormorant. So again, it depends on how you see these birds. And, um, and then, you know, if you're seeing them up close or not, whether you think of them as sort of ugly old birds or in fact, pretty good looking birds. Depends on your frame of uh, reference there. All right, one of the other birds that, um, that is out in the harbor, that's quite common, but local to where there are rocks is the black oyster catcher. They actually breed in the harbor and they look like this big dark bird with almost like a carrot that just sticks out of its, its head. It's such a bright uh, orangey looking and big beak that it looks just like a little small carrot that sticks out of the beak. And I would just want to play voice for you. I was just catching up there and seeing if people were seeing the images. I think they are. And it looks like some people didn't get to see the cormorant images and other people did. So I don't know what that was about. Um, but black oyster catchers, a couple of things to tell you about. One of them is if you look really closely at the eye on some of the individuals, it looks like their, their pupil isn't quite round. It looks like it's, you know, sort of up and down. And in fact, what it is, is the iris, the area around the pupil on some individuals has some dark bits. And when that dark bit makes the, the pupil not look round, those are females. And the ones that have a super round uh, pupil are the males. So you can identify males and females by looking at something very specific. The other thing is that oyster catchers in other parts of the world, um, especially the ones studied in, in, in England, so it's a different kind of oyster catcher, it's called the European oyster catcher. What they've studied is that they don't actually all eat oysters, but they do eat clams and other shellfish like that. And the oyster catchers will sometimes make a hole in the side of the clam and, and grip the muscle of the clam and allow it to open in that way, right? And other oyster catchers will take their beak and stick it between the two shells of the, of the clam, get at that muscle and open up the clam in, in that way. So you have two different ways to open up these bivalves, these clams or you know whatever they might be that they're eating. And um, they learn how to do that from their parents. And, uh, and usually a pair will both use the same system in opening up bivalves. And then so you, you sort of mate with a bird that opens the, the, the clam in the same way that you do and you teach your kids your baby oyster catchers, how to open clams based on the system that you know. So if you get at that, you realize that oyster catchers have culture. It's, it's, it's something that's passed from bird to bird, from generation to generation, and it's not genetic. It's just the way they do something. And weirdly enough, their bill shapes change a little bit depending on which kind of, of, of 
clam opening culture they belong to. So it, there you go, birds can have culture. Um, the pigeon guillemot is a bird that has become more common uh, in the harbor. It breeds there, so it's there between about April and September. And they're really cool looking birds. They're related to the puffin. They look like the, the dark duck with a white patch on the, on the wings, but they sit a little higher up in the water than a duck and they have these bright, bright red feet. And they also have bright red inside the mouth. So if they ever are screaming at each other, they, they will look red around the inside the mouth. And they, they breed in the rocks, in, in the jetty, especially that outer jetty that's not connected, but also past the, the, um, the fishing, um, you know, the fishing pier, there are some that are breeding in there and their population seems to be increasing every year. And we didn't have them 10 plus, maybe 15 years ago. I don't think they were breeding in our harbor, but they definitely breed there now. There's a lot of fish in the harbor. And I love when, when the herons, the great blue herons are just walking around, you know, the, around the boats. They're so big, I think they kind of pretend they're people and, and figure nobody's going to you know, know that know that they're they're actually out there for the fish. And one of the reasons that that the herons like to walk on the on the slips is that little fish like to get into the shadow underneath the the slip, and that's what they're looking for is that shadow and access to those fish that are under there. So uh, hopefully, you know, if you see that, you can wait and actually eventually watch them hunt down hunt down some um, some fish. The um, other bird we talked about, I think we just mentioned, but we didn't see a picture of it that is in the harbor is a black crown night heron. And the black crown night heron is uh, a mostly nocturnal, but they will be out in the day at times. They are smaller, sort of a, a more thick set, short legged heron. And when they're adults, they're really this crisp black and white plumage with the dark cap and this dark back and gray and white underneath. They're, they're really quite distinctive. Then when they're youngsters, they, um, they're they brown with stripes and speckles. And again, this is one of those birds where you can say, ooh, look at that ugly old brown bird. Or you could just key into those patterns on the wing and every one of those white bits looks like just almost like a perfect drop shape. And uh, you wonder why it is that way, but it just, it's actually kind of a mesmerizing pattern if you look at it up close, and then it's a totally different bird if you look at it from afar. I always think of um, night herons, they always kind of look tired to me and kind of hunched over, and it, it just really does, and their eyes are red, so it just looks like they never got enough sleep. So that's one of the ways you can identify a black crown night heron at any age is that shape. This one on the right, this adult's all alert because it's fishing, but they're not always fishing. Um, so black front night heron and both the great blue herons and the night herons breed in the harbor in some of the bigger trees. Because of the fish and the access to fish without major waves coming in and out, so the harbor breaks all those waves, we, we get some birds that need a little bit calmer water to fish in, like the belted kingfisher. Belt, belted kingfishers, the belt is this sort of dark, it could be, you know, just blue or blue and red depending on, on whether it's male or female and then this white stripe around the the neck so that the blue gray of the head is separated from the blue gray of, of the of the body and you can see that whether they're flying or sitting and also um keep in mind again about shape look how little the legs are on a kingfisher they almost look like they're standing on their belly like sitting on their belly and they also have a huge huge head so the head almost, you know, if you were to take that head and sort of put it back and see how many heads you could fit into the body, you only get like two or two and a half. Even in the flying bird, this is a really, really big headed bird. You know, they're almost like, you know, you know how toddlers look like they have the tiny body and a big head is they have a toddler shape to them, these belted kingfishers. And again, I mention this because once you see these differences in shape, they're, they're astounding. Look, look at that at Western Goal, how its head is actually way smaller compared to the body, compared to a kingfisher. Now you're not gonna, you're not gonna mistake a kingfisher for a gull, but you can see once you start looking at the shapes, how much that helps to identify a lot of birds. The Western Gulls also breed, um, Oh, I see some people are not seeing the presentations. So I'm going to stop sharing and then share again. And uh, let's see here.
see if that works. Hopefully that'll work. Just sort of a, a share and reshare. And um, so yeah, for some reason, some people are seeing, some people are not seeing the talk. I'm not sure um, why that why that's happening. And hopefully that resharing has, has helped. It seems like every time we get a new technological uh, problem, we fix the last one and we get a new one. So yeah, you know, Zoom <laughs> still still in its infancy as far as uh, our program goes. But Western Gull breeds on those jetties. It's one of the most common breeding species uh, on in the harbor. And I don't have any pictures of the fuzzy little young um, but they're right now, they're, they're sort of getting not quite as big as these birds that can fly already, these dark, these dark um, youngsters here, but uh, they're, they're almost ready to fledge. So very soon you'll start seeing these, these dark birds flying around, but right now they're all in the nest growing their feathers. So they're going from the stage of being downy to the stage of, of being feathered. And we have several hundred nests of Western gulls. On, in the harbor. As far as I know, they're the only gull that actually nests in our harbor. We, we can have California gulls around, not nesting in the harbor, they nest in the bayside. And I just wanted to say, you know, gulls mostly look like this. See how these, Calif uh, these western gulls have white heads, white bodies, gray backs, black wingtips. California gulls also have white heads, white bodies, gray backs, black wingtips. Differences in the color of the bill with the California having a little dark mark as well as a red mark and little duller bill colors. The um, green, um, the green um, <clears throat> legs as opposed to the pink legs of the Western gull. And um, then this gull, the Hermans that we talked about last time just doesn't look like a regular gull, right? It is all dark dark. It doesn't have the white on the underparts. It actually has dark on the tail, dark on the body, dark everywhere. There are only a few dark gulls like this in the world. And every single one of them is a bird that nests in the desert in very hot places. And it's thought that in fact this, even though you'd think that a whiter bird would be able to sort of deflect that heat better than a dark bird, what appears to happen is that these birds um, hold their feathers fluffed when they're in those hot areas over their nest. And the, the outside of, of their feathers actually really heats up. They get a layer of air between the outside of the feathers and the body. And then that heat just gets, you know, um, bounce off the bird in a sense, or retransmitted out to the environment. And being dark might actually be better in those desert situations than being pale body like these uh, California gulls. So Hearman's gulls, a desert nesting bird, and most of them um, nest in um, one island in Baja California called Isla Grasa. Uh, Isla Grasa is a big, it's a pretty big island, but it's kind of out in the middle of the Sea of Cortez. And, you know, the only other colony that exists of, of these birds is actually in Monterey County, believe it or not. I'm just gonna see here um, if uh, see people are seeing it again, it just sort of getting a... Uh, uh, yeah, if, if people are seeing it already, let me know. Just uh, so I'll just keep track of, um, I, did, I didn't see the last, uh, uh, okay. All right, some people said that it helped that they left the, the talk and then re-entered the talk and it seems to be working for them so I don't know what that's about but anyways these are Hearman's gulls and this one down here the real real dark one is a younger bird and the one with the whiter head is a, an adult these are multi birds this is what they what they actually are, are looking like right now um, and I want to say that that other colony is of Hearman's gulls is found in Monterey County in the town of Seaside that lake Roberts Lake that's right by the big hotel, the Embassy Suites. And uh, that is the only other place that uh, Hearman's gulls breed other than this one island in Baja California. And these poor birds used to breed on an island in, in the lake way back. And then that got something happened to it. I don't know if it was weather that just weathered it down. And then they started breeding on the buildings up, up around the, uh, you know, that the McDonald's and so forth and there's been a fire all sorts of stuff like these poor birds are trying to make it a go in Seaside 
And now there's a group called Seaside Humans Goals that you can go to their website and they have a GoFundMe page that have created a floating island for the Humans Goals to actually nest in. If you're ever going by there too, go and stop and see this. But um, it might take a couple of years. They have little fake um, Humans Goals and they're trying to attract them to that place. And once they do, they'll finally have a safe place to nest because the roofs are not safe for them. A lot of the landowners actually have not wanted to have these gulls nesting on the roofs, even though it's one of the most important single colonies of gulls on earth because it's only the second colony of an entire species. Um, there you go, elegant tern is a kind of a relative of the humans, the gulls, and just like humans, gulls, and pelicans, they come in from the south at this time of year, and I haven't seen if they're, they're yet back at the, at the harbor, but the, once they start coming back, they'll be there in hundreds, and they get real noisy right around the specific parts of the, the jetties, and they will drop into the water to get fish with these very long bills, so if you see a bird diving into the water that looks kind of like a gull, those are the terns because gulls do not dive for fish like this. Um, when you're out in, in the harbor, also look for the other wildlife that's there like harbor seals. Harbor seals are nice and speckly looking. They actually have really big nostrils if you, if you see them up close. And one thing to look for is that they don't have any ears. There's no ear flap on the side. There's no flap. Um, they actually have ears, but they don't actually um, have ear flaps. And that's important to separate them from the sea lions. Sea lions have a different head shape, a little bit more dog-like with this ear flap. And if you look at, you know, a seal, like a seal will, can't actually raise its body up. They don't have that kind of structure where they can sort of crawl around. So they look kind of almost like just these uh, helpless, you know, sort of blobs uh, when they're off out of the water they're really really fast and you know versatile when they're swimming but the sea lions can actually climb and you'll see them you know kind of going up their their flippers so then you know you have a sea lion versus a seal and he is also to look for that ear flap if you're uh, or really long fin so if you see a long fin sticking out of the water like in this bird i mean this animal down here then you know you're looking at a sea lion and not seal go to the um, yacht club and they hang out out there in the in the rafts if you want to see them other wildlife great place to see gophers <laughs> in the harbor and little crabs and fish and all sorts of things um if you wanted to know the gopher here it's not just the gopher or sometimes people put other words that i'm not going to repeat before they say gopher it's actually called bottas pocket gopher that's the official name bottas pocket gopher so if you want to get official with the gopher and then, you know, when it's low tide going out beyond Mavericks to look for all sorts of uh, cool things that the, uh, you know, that get revealed like um, um, anemones and so forth. Um, here's my son's now taller than I am. This is taken a long time ago and you can tell because he, we had just been crab fishing and he's got this uh, sea star and the sea stars about 2013 really started declining because of something called uh, sea star wasting disease, which they still don't quite understand what it is. There might be a virus associated with it. It might be due to warmer waters. It might be a multiple things going on, but they're, they're, are, they're picking up again. We lost a lot of our sea stars and I, I'm seeing more of them now, but they used to be all over the place. Um, here in the harbor. So it's super sad to see that these creatures that we just sort of thought were common suddenly disappeared nearly overnight in the harbor and hopefully we're getting them back. The, the salt marsh is sort of right, right beneath the golf ball and it's, it doesn't look like a classic marsh with the tall upright vegetation because it is a salt marsh and it's uh, you know, made of pickle weed and other plants that can tolerate, tolerate salt. Um, and that area is really good for looking for ducks and herons and other species you won't see anywhere else in, in, in the area. And if you get up into the, into the chaparral up above in the bluffs, that's where the spotted towhees and the Buicks wrens and the white crown sparrows, and sometimes even the California thrasher might be there. California thrashers are like um, California towhee, but they, in color, but they have this bill that droops almost like that wimbrel bird I showed you last time. And they're shy, hard to see, but late winter, they get up on top of the shrubs and sometimes into the spring and summer and sing. 
um, and that's the easiest time to see them. Um, then they can disappear, just, you know, go right down into the base of the shrubs and you won't see them for, for a long time. And in this area too of, of the salt marsh and even the creek mouths is where you'll see other coots, uh, coots and ducks. Coots are these duck-like creatures related to the rails, um, but they're not ducks. And then many ducks can be seen on, in the harbor, like this is a bufflehead and there are golden eyes and there are surf scoters and there are mallards and sometimes other ducks will come in there. But coots become a, a prominent part of the harbor landscape uh, starting in about September and now throughout the winter there's a lot of coots and they have these white beaks. They almost look like chicken-like beaks rather than duck-like beaks. And coots are, are really, can be really uh, pugnacious. They will fight. Uh, I don't know why they fight. They'll fight even in winter. And you know, they eat food that isn't particularly concentrated, like they'll eat grass and they'll eat just stuff around rocks. But I, I think they're just mean. Um, they, and look at the feet. The feet don't have webs. They're not like ducks. They have these um, feet that each little toe has like, like an area that expands so that they can push the water as they swim, but they have a very different type of foot com uh, as compared to a duck. So look at, look for coots. Now, where do these names come from? You know, you heard the term old coot, and it seems to come from old, a Dutch, German, English, old word that means sort of like a dumb fellow. Um, and then I don't know if the bird got the name from the word and the word got, you know, where it comes from, but sort of, a dumb guy is a coot um, and well if you you know actually if you look at coots and you see them bobbing around and swimming you know they don't actually look that smart I gotta admit um, and then this bird over here was famous for us for a little bit we had a red-footed booby which is a tropical bird and he's being looked at here by a Hearman's gull and booby comes from the word the old Spanish sailors bobo meaning dumb, again, silly, because boobies, when they land, they're, you know, they, they're not very graceful when they land. And they you know, sometimes even you know, hit the rock and kind of do a little spill before they, they actually gather themselves up and preen a little bit. So again, it, it's, it's a lot of words that mean sort of silly or goofy or what have you, goony. Um, the albatross that I showed you last time, the black-footed albatross, all those northern albatrosses were called goonies by the sailors. And again, if you see an albatross, or if you've been to Hawaii where the albatross breed, and you, or Galapagos, and you see these birds trying to land, often they, you know, they don't, they're not very graceful. So they all got these funny names from the fact that they're not graceful, or they're silly looking, or dumb looking, or so forth, all these old names. And another old name, Gannet, is, um, I don't know where it comes from, it might be Norse. It's a, it's a bird, um, the Atlantic Gannet from the Atlantic. And we've had, it's a re relative of the booby. You can actually tell that bill shape is similar to the red-footed booby. The Gannet is all white. And there is, the story about the, the Gannet is that we have one, one individual Gannet that's been around here for years. And it's gone to the Farallon Islands. Sometimes it's and this sail rock uh, just outside of our harbor. Sometimes it's in the harbor. Sometimes it disappears for months. And it's one individual bird that made it from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And we think, or a lot of people think, that what happened is that as as the Arctic became ice free, and um, one of this this gannet just started wandering wandering around out there and um, made it to the Pacific. And uh, it's been sitting here trying to find a mate. It's kind of sad. It, it does its displays to the cormorants and so forth and everybody ignores it. I've seen it actually next to a booby and weirdly enough, even those two are related to each other, they ignored each other. So the gannet's been a bird that's been hanging around. It's kind of interesting and our harbor is a place where it sometimes shows up. Um, we can get geese in, in the harbor. The Canada geese breed there now. They're a new arrival to the coast. We did not have them a dozen years ago. And a migratory goose that can come in and feed on, on grass and seaweed when it's very marine is the brant. So brant have this little collar. They don't have white going up the, um, the face like a Canada goose. Brant are, are pretty, pretty cool birds. They breed way up in the Arctic and then can winter down here or all the way into Baja. The, 
<clears throat> Finally, I'll show you a little bit about the Maverick side of, of the harbor. And this is an area that where if you get into the corner of this jetty and the rocky areas, these are really good for shore birth. And in fact, if you ever see anybody like running the dog in the beach and so forth, that, you know, there's not much, I will say that there's not much harm on the beach. It's not legal and so forth, but really in the rocks, really try to keep dogs away from the rocks. because That's where the birds are actually trying to get little fuel rest um, on their migrations. And, um, you know, we've had peregrine falcons last year that uh, nested in the area. They didn't nest this year, and, but there are peregrine falcons often trying to um, hunt for the shorebirds that are in the area. And when you go and walk out there in the water, you'll see grebes, especially as the winter approaches. Grebes, again, are not ducks. They have pointy bills. The most common are the western, which is big and it's like black and white. And then the eared, which is down here, a breeding one with its really fancy look up here top and a non-breeding one down at the bottom. Look how red the, the eyes are on grebes. And, um, you know, one of the oddities that has come out of genetic studies, uh, sorting out who's related to what, grebes are not related to loons. We always thought loons and grebes were each other's close rel closest relatives, but grebes appear to be more closely related to the least likely looking thing to them that you could imagine, flamingos. They are related to flamingos, not closely, but their closest relative is a flamingo, which to me still, I cannot believe. Common loons, when they're here, they tend to be in a winter plumage. And look also how these loons and grebes have like their feet way back for, for really efficient um, diving, they're not very efficient at walking. These birds, uh, if you ever see a grebe or a loon on the shore, it's because they're sick. And then um, you might wanna call somebody to a Penicilla Humane Society to go and, and get that bird if they're sick. Surf scoters are out there. I mentioned golden eyes and other ducks. And then sort of the, the real, <clears throat> the real uh, birds of note that collect up in that corner are shorebirds and, and in the, Migration, it could be multiple species, Western sandpiper, sanderling, dunlin, and then in the rocks themselves, there are birds that are specifically tied to wintering and migrating in those rocky ocean habitats. One of them is the black turnstone down here with the upturned beak, and then the surf bird with that thicker beak and the, and the yellow orange in the bill. The, the turnstones will actually use that beak to put it underneath like a mat of vegetation or, or a pebble or a rock and will flip it. So they do actually turn stones. It's actually a good name. And the surf birds, they're right there in the surf, in the rocks. So it's a good name too. Um, surf birds a little bit fatter, bigger, and has often little spots on the sides of the body while the, the turn stone has no spots on the side of the body and it's a little smaller and they look for that beak shape. And then if, um, if you're lucky, a little rarer is the wandering tattler. I don't know if you can hear this. If, um, if you don't hear it, it's because I switched off something when I re, you know, reshared, just in case that was, uh, that was doing something to, to um, the visibility for some of the people. So uh, um, yeah, I apologize if that was not something you could hear. But in Hawaii, this bird is called the ulili because of its call. And they only see them as a wintering bird. And, and I want to just point out, like, this is just a, average looking shorebird with some you know yellowish legs long body it's got a cool name the wandering tattler but maybe what's most amazing about it is that it has this really small breeding distribution up in alaska but from there it disperses through all sorts of parts of the pacific so it can be found on many of the pacific islands even the most isolated spot on earth on the pacific easter island rapa nui it's found all the way on the coast to Galapagos and, and it just disperses and flies these long nonstop distances over water to get to these islands. Um, maybe not as um, impressive in their migrations are the little shorebirds we call peeps. And here the two common ones are western and least sandpipers. Least are browner, browner on the breast, smaller, often crouch more and have yellowish green legs. The westerns are a little bit bigger, longer bills, whiter underneath and black legs. Um, they vary in coloration uh, depending on the breeding season. 
Um, these are youngsters and uh, to me these young birds are often the ones you get the best looks at in August, September because being juveniles they're, they're not as shy as the adults. Sometimes Dunlin will show up in the breeding season in the harbor in May you'll get these beautiful black breasted uh, and red-backed Dunlin and right now when they start showing up actually they show up in September, um, October they're they look a little bit darker browner in fact the word Dun means brown. It's the, the brown bird. And we're just going to end here soon with the last shorebirds. I wanted to show you plovers. Now, these are sandpipers, dunlins. These are all sandpipers. And sandpipers tend to have, tend to have longer be bills. And they find their food by poking for it and probing for it. Plovers tend to have short bills and big eyes. And they find their food by looking for it. So they will walk around find food and grab it rather than probing. So if you see a bird probing, it's a sandpiper. If you see a bird walking around kind of erratically over the rocks or over the sand, those are plovers as they're looking for food. And the small plover with one band that we see here in, in the harbor is the semi-palmated. Remember the snowy is similar, but it's in the beach elsewhere, not in the harbor. And then if you see a bigger one with two bands, almost anywhere in the county, that's the, the killdeer. And, um, its name for its call. Well, there we go. A little, you know, uh, voyage through the harbor and uh, hopefully, you know, the issues, um, if you miss some of the slides when we have that recording up, you might be able to catch up on, on some of that and apologize for that, for that issue. Um, you know, it's a, uh, it always seems like we've got everything sorted out for the next talk and, uh, and we get a new issue. So that's, that keeps it fun, right? Fun and interesting. Um, and ne next week, our talk will be on Sunday, not Saturday, because I'm going out to the Fairlawns on Saturday. So I'll be able to give you a Fairlawn report of what we saw, hopefully. Hopefully the weather will be good enough that we can get out there. And, um, and there we go, let's see. Um, let me look at some questions. We've got some time. Um, yes, somebody said technology keeps it fun and interesting, but you know, we can, we can complain about the technology, but if we didn't have this, we wouldn't be able to do this at all. So, um, and uh, let's see, a lot of these questions were about why can't I see the Cormorant slide? So, um, um, so uh, somebody said that, um, John Muir Laws, uh, Jack, who's a, if you haven't looked him up, he's an, a birder, artist, naturalist, done several books and he does classes on illustration and how to look at nature through art. He's a, he says uh, his coots are hugely territorial, even claim their spot permanently, hence the fights. And, you know, I, I, I totally agree with that. I, I just think it's weird, usually birds that are territorial are being territorial over something really specific, like a specific food sort, like a tree full of berries or a set of flowers, like a hummingbird. But if coots are feeding on a lawn by a, you know, um, a golf course pond, it just seems like there's enough lawn for all those coots. Uh, I, don't, I don't understand why the territoriality sort of occurs in a bird that is so general and they are mean. Um, and, um, Somebody uh, sent, um, <clears throat> mentioned not to pick up animals from the tide pools. That's definitely something you should not do. I, I'll, I'll mention that that sea star, we were uh, crab fishing. And when, when you, uh, sometimes when the crab bait, uh, the, the sea stars would go around the little box of crab bait and you'd pull them up. And the only way to get the sea star off them is to actually take them off and drop them back in the water. So it's uh, one of those. So I'll defend my picture of the, uh, of uh, my kid with with his starfish. Um, and uh, how to identify Caspian, elegant, and common terns. Here we tend to have Caspian and elegant. On the bay side, you will have Forster's terns. Commons are actually not very common. If we see them here, they're way offshore. Cas Caspians are bigger than elegants. They have redder beaks, bigger redder beaks. They also have black on the underside of the wing, a lot more black. Elegants are paler, thinner winged, long droopy bill, 
that tends to be yellowish to orange to salmon, but not dark red. So big, thick, dark red bill, Caspian. And with black on the underwings, Caspian. Um, elegants tend to come in, in in big groups and they're coastal, although now we have a breeding population on the bay. And um, they, they're they noisy and they, they sound like, um, Caspians have this really low, deep, you know, voice kind of rah, 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 rah. you hear this weird sound. Elegants are high pitched in their calls. Um, so are the starfish healthy in the area? Well, they're, they seem to be increasing and they're increasing in parts of Alaska and Oregon. They seem to be coming back. I don't think they're healthy in a sense because they're not until they're back to original populations then, uh, then we, you know, we don't have a resolution to this problem. Um, there's some thought that high levels of nutrients, warm water, um, and some other elements cause the, the starfish to actually, in a sense, um, almost like an autoimmune disease. You know, they, they, they were trying to get them, you know, themselves sorted out and their body totally reacted against their body and, and killed them. And the virus that's been associated with this might have been a correlated, but not actually the cause. So they're still figuring out what's going on with the starfish. Um, what do they feed? What do these uh, hermen skulls feed on when they're out there in the desert? Well, most of these desert feeding um, nesting gulls are near very rich water. So the Hermann skulls might be in a desert island, but then they'll fish out in the Sea of Cortez, or if they're um, the birds, the lava gulls that breed in, in, in Galapagos, or the gray gulls that breed in the middle of the desert in Chile, or white-eyed gulls and sooty gulls in you know, the Red Sea and, and, and you know, the Middle East, they all breed near really good um, fishing areas. So they go to the beaches and the ocean but they just often have to fly uh, some distance. In fact, the ones in Chile sometimes will have to fly over a hundred kilometers to get back to the coast. They do that at night, go fishing during the day and, and then come back the, the next night to feed the young. Um, then, um, let's see, Hermans. Yeah, Mon somebody said if they were Monterey Bay, so I, I guess I, you, you saw that slide. Hey, Kate. <laughs> Almost done, huh? <laughs> um, oh, somebody wanted me to repeat the eye difference between the male and female oyster catcher. So uh, all birds have a round uh, pupil in the middle of an iris. And the oyster catchers sometimes look like the pupil is not round and that's because there's like little dark bits in, in the iris. If you have the non-round pupil, they're females, if I remember correctly. And if they have the round looking pupil, they're the males. I'll just say that the pupil actually is round. It's just that there's little dark bits that make it look like it's not round. <laughs> there you go. I'm so sorry that that, you know, I guess some people weren't seeing it for a while, but hopefully the, the recorded version will be 100%. We'll see. And we can all agree that you are an incredible trooper with this. <laughs> all <laughs> these different technical things that are happening along the way. Thank you again for, for all of this. And, and to all of you, thank you for, for being here. And also thank you for your patience um, and your feedback. Um, so many of you are so helpful along the way if there are things that come up. So, but just a reminder that we will be, um, all of this is recorded and, and um, from our end is looking beautiful. So the recording will be perfect for you. So um, it'll be up within the next, by tomorrow. So if you want to check it out on our website, otherwise, it, um, Alvaro has been really kind for those of you who have been here before. Alvaro has been really kind to respond to all of your questions, all of your really good questions. Um, and thank you for sending those questions. Um, he will be sending you a follow-up email within the next couple of days. Um, this is old hat for those of you who, has, who have been doing this, who've been to a few of these um, webinars, but uh, they'll, they'll have responses to your questions and also um, a link to the video. Um, also, just a reminder that next week, Alvaro will be finishing the series with Raptors from, of Wavecrest, and so that one should be a really great sort of crescendo to it all. Um, we will be at 11.30, so that there is a day change and a time change, so 11.30 on Sunday. Um, if you want to sign up for it, there's a link here. Also, just, just head up to our website. It, it leads you to it in a bunch, bunch of different ways. You cannot miss it, but it's just coastatelandtrust.org. Um, 
And then, um, let's see. Um, also, you know, there's, if anybody is not following us on social media, it's a great way to be connected, just to know. We will send you emails periodically, but we work really hard not to send too many. Um, so if you get on our social media, then you can kind of see it as you enjoy it. Um, it pops up and go, and you can remember, oh, we've got this bird series. Oh, we um, have a, a, a neat um, flower and plant series that's gonna be coming up um, down the pike a bit. So you wanna be updated on that. And if you are, then you know that the goats are at uh, Railroad right away, which is pretty fun to see. See, we have a little video of that up um, taken by some some local folks that are, were kind enough to share some of their their video footage so um, if you would like to get on our Facebook just uh, Facebook Instagram LinkedIn Twitter any of those things um, and then thank you again to those of you who have donated you know most of you know that we are a nonprofit and we are funded by grants and by the generous donations of people like you and we've been grateful to see um, or we've been grateful to receive a, a great amount of really generous donations and we're thankful for that. Um, it is oh, what allows us to do the, the important conservation work that we're doing um, as well as these types of things that are helping to inform the community and, and bring us all together in kind of a tricky time. So um, yeah, thanks for being here. Thank you again, all of you for your patience and your kindness and um, thank you Alvaro for another awesome um, presentation and we will see you all next Sunday at 1130. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right, <laughs>